Hey everybody, this is Neo once again from the Overshock magazine and today I'm bringing you the baddest board from ROG and when I say the baddest board from ROG, I'm talking about the ROG Maximus Z790 Extreme and everything about this board is extreme including its price. So let's talk about that price. Right now, this motherboard can be had from Amazon for 999, right? That's $999, so it's a thousand dollar motherboard and locally, well, that may be a bit problematic because you may not be able to buy it locally. However, however, you still can import it. And if you do import it, I think including duties and shipping and everything, it comes down to 22,000. So 22,000 is a lot of money to spend on the motherboard. But given everything that is put on this board, I sort of understand. And besides, if you are the kind of user that is often looking at these sorts of products and buying in this price range, boards, VGAs, whatever it is, I don't think the price is going to be an issue for you. What you want to know is, does this deliver? And from where I'm sitting, I definitely think this delivers. In fact, I would be hard pressed to find somebody who says this board doesn't deliver on its promise of literally being the ultimate motherboard for the Z790 platform. Let's talk about the features on this motherboard. Let's start with just power. I'm not a power guru, but I will tell you that it uses a 24 plus one PWM design or power circuitry design rather. And with that, it's 105 M power stages. What does that mean to you? It means it will power everything. 13900K, 13900KS, LN2, liquid helium, whatever you have you. It's over-engineered, it's over-designed, and that's particularly why you buy this motherboard. But to cool all of this power circuitry, you're going to need some beefy heat sinks. And this is where Asus has probably put more of the weight of this motherboard than anywhere else. The heat sinks, the aluminum heat sinks here are beefy as hell. Okay, they, they make up a lot of the weight here. And even the back plate gets in on the action. You know, that black plate is also cooling some of the power circuitry amongst other ICs as well. So in terms of just build quality and just assuring that the power is always reliable, I think Asus has done the job here. In fact, why would you expect any less? So talking further about cooling, which is actually a theme that goes right across this motherboard. Let's just talk about the M.2 cooling. So of course we have the DIM.2, which is actually two of the five total M.2 sockets that this motherboard, or at least the motherboard package supports. So DIM.2 has always had these beefy heat sinks for your M.2 socket SSD. So that's not going to be an issue. However, for the motherboard, for the first time, or at least my first experience, I'm looking at a motherboard that is capable of cooling both the underside and the top side of your M.2 SSD. And they're actually thermal pads from the bottom and the top, where usually you just get ones from the top and nothing else. So this is definitely going to help in just keeping temperatures a little bit lower. And particularly for those high performance drives, I think you would definitely appreciate this. Okay, so now that we've covered the M.2 sockets, let's just talk about just basic connectivity on this board. So of course, where Wi-Fi is concerned, you're looking at Wi-Fi 6E. And I'm not sure about the controller here, but I think it's an Intel controller, uh, maybe AX411 or something like that. I'm really not sure. The reason I suspect this is AX411 is because it allows you to make two connections via your Wi-Fi, meaning that you'll connect to your 6 gigahertz or 5 gigahertz, but you'll also make a connection to your 2.4 gigahertz frequency as well. Now we're talking further about connectivity. So what you do get here is two LAN ports. There's one 2.5G LAN that's courtesy of an Intel controller. And the other one is a 10 gigabit per second LAN and that's courtesy of a Marvel controller. Besides that connectivity, let's just go, let's, in fact, let's stick to the rear IO, right? Because that is a really important part of this board. For the first time in my life, I'm looking at a motherboard that has not the number of USB ports, but the type of USB ports. So we're looking at 10 gigabits per second on every single port minimum. And that includes three type C USB ports on the rear IO. So one is Thunderbolt 4. The other one is 20 gigabits per second. That's USB 3.2 Gen 2 X2. Gosh, I, yeah, it's so long having to say that. But anyway, it's a 20 gigabits per second port. And the other one is a regular 10 gigabits per second port, but it's also USB type C. So talking about audio as well, the audio solution here is the controller, of course, is your Realtek 4082, but it's not just the controller, it's everything else that's built around it. So you are going to get an ESS DAC, I think. I think it's the 9218 quad DAC. 
that's also on this motherboard so you're going to get the audio shielding you're going to get the pcb layer separation but you also get impedance sensing for your line out that's in the rear and also for your front uh line out your headphone stereo mini jack at the front as well which is pretty dope which is pretty dope but i think for me the most important thing here is that you also get a dts license as well all of this makes sure that you have some of the best audio quality that you are going to get on any motherboard so the last thing that i actually want to get to is just the things that are on the motherboard so since this is an extreme board it actually covers the entire range of what rog is capable of bringing to you using their board so it's a cover and take care of the people who are interested in XOC. Not that you should be doing any sort of XOC on this board. I just think it's too beautiful for you to put Vaseline on it. If you want to do that sort of stuff, not that the Apex isn't good looking, but the Apex is better suited for this sort of thing. However, many of the features, if not all of the XOC features that are on the Apex board are actually on the Extreme as well. So what am I talking about here? There are B-clock buttons, so you don't have to use software or anything. You can just B-clock up down. You've got your VLATCH switch, you've got your BIOS switch, you've got a reserved switch with RSVD, you've got a reserve button, you've got MEM, it's not MEM OK, but it's safe boot, which is effectively the same thing, right? So you do get safe boot, you do get retry, and you do get the power button, you do get the reset button, and of course I mentioned the BIOS switch button as well. But you also get voltage measuring points, and you also get the LN2 mode jumper, you also get the VLEDGE switch as well. So all of these things are actually concerned with XOC. And of course, there are the profiles as well for XOC. So if you enable the LN2 jumper, you'll be able to load up the XOC uh, profiles and so forth, which go a long way into helping you getting up and running, right? You can just load the profile and bring your pot down to temperature and just go. But then again, I will say, this is not the kind of board that I would want to do any XOC on. I think it's just too beautiful and it just costs a lot. You know, anything can happen when you're doing XOC. But anyway, it caters for that crowd, but also caters for the gaming crowd as well. And the reason I say that is because even more connectivity is actually on the motherboard more than on the rear IO. There's another Thunderbolt 4 USB usb type c connector on the board itself literally but on top of it there's also another 20 gigabits per second header as well for your front io now here's the thing about that this front io uh 20 gigabits per second usb port it does support up to 60 watts of power and that i think that's pd3 pd3 spec or ppw spec i'm really not sure about that but for you to be able to deliver up to 60 watts of power you're going to need to be able to plug an additional six pin PCIe connector or rather cable to the motherboard. But more than any of that, I just love how this motherboard looks. The Maximus Extreme is an aspirational product. It's not, it's not about value for money, none of that stuff. Not that it shouldn't be value for money, but that's not important. It's secondary for the same reason nobody buys a Rolls Royce because it's value for money. And this is exactly what this is. Now, the thing that I liked even more than all of this is just how easy it was to overclock here. There are many things that Asus puts in their BIOS. Memory profiles, as I said, if you enable LN2 mode, there's a LN2 profile for you as well. There's AI tuner. There's all sorts of things that you can use on the Asus uh, BIOS that allow you to extract even more performance from your chosen CPU, including by default multi-core enhancement, which is on already, right? When you power on the board, by default is actually on but what i will say is that i used ai tuner a lot more than anything else and the reason i say that is because ai tuner allowed me to figure out how i should be configuring my cores because ai tuner gives you the best cores of course on the 13900k but with that it also tells you which cores which cores are likely to be able to do what frequency but more than that as well there is the sp rating which everybody's familiar with this is not absolute it does not mean that if you have a high SP rating, your CPU will necessarily be the best one. But thus far, it seems to correlate with the quality of the silicon that people are actually experiencing with the 13th gen core CPUs. Just being able to know that this CPU is 94 SP or 100 SP or 84 SP, whatever have you, allows you a starting place for you to tune and not only does it give you the sp score it actually shows you in frequency and voltage around what you should be expecting you can always do better than this 
but it does help when it comes to figuring out which core you want to be turning off which core you want to limit frequencies and so forth so it does really really have a meaningful effect in how you configure your system and how quickly you can get up and running but there's one thing i forgot to mention to you guys there is as well a fan controller which asus puts in the package as well now this fan controller is not just any run-of-the-mill fan controller it's actually a premium one it has your argb uh, connectivity on it and of course your fan connectivity and so forth but you also get the ROG True Voltation, which harkens back to the XOC roots of this motherboard. The True Voltation, if you have to ask what the True Voltation is, then the True Voltation is not for you. However, just be glad that it's on the motherboard or rather in the package rather, and you can install it on the motherboard. With that said, what do I think overall? Is this motherboard worth the $1,000 asking price or 22,000 Rand asking price if you import it? I think so. I definitely think so is it expensive hideously so obscenely so right but like i said for everybody else you should probably just take a look at a hero board and just ignore this one but if you are that sort of person that is attracted to this sorts of boards then i definitely think you should do yourself a favor and give this serious consideration to this one because it is a wow it is really really a good void it is awesome in every way in every way except the price but with that said, before I even get there, please, please check out the benchmarks. See how far I got. I ended up at DDR5, 6800, CL32, blah. You, I think you even saw those settings when I did the G-Skill Trident Z, Z5 RGB memory review, which you can click in the link below. So when I did that, I actually did that on this motherboard. So that will tell you what kind of frequencies I got to. But anyway... The max OC that I did, I think was 5.9 gigahertz for single core lightly threaded, 5.5 uh, gigahertz or 5.6 gigahertz, excuse me, for all core frequency. And of course, I did uh, DDR5 6800CL32 with Hynix MDI ICs. So that configuration works supremely well. And in fact, I was able to configure it in a way that I still stayed under 253 watts PO2 limit. And that's just was just using the voltage frequency curve, uh, limiting the overall power draw and so forth. But I'll get into those details at a later point, or at least not in this review. Anyway, check out the benchmarks. Let me know what you guys think of this motherboard. I know it's expensive, but if you had the means, would you buy this motherboard? Until then, take care of yourselves and I'll see you guys on the flip side. Remember to share, like, subscribe and peace.